and welcome to back to Mentors on Fire podcast. Tonight, we're going to speak to my good friend, Colleen Walls, and we have Mike Benton who's going to join us tonight. Colleen, how are you tonight? I'm good. I'm great. Um, nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, good to, to have you back. We, we tried this once before, and uh, we're going to work through the issue tonight. We're going to we're going to get everything recorded and get it out there. And we're really excited to have you back. So thanks for making time. You're welcome. My pleasure. All right. A little bit for uh, a little bit about Chief Walls. Um, Colleen Walls has over 30. I can't see without my glasses, by the way. <laughs> 35 years. <laughs> 35 years of, of fire service experience, eight and a half as fire chief and emergency manager with St. John's Fire District. In South Carolina, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yep. And the first 26 years as a member of the city of Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire as the deputy chief. So I'm going to make some notes here because we talked about that last time. All right. Um, chief Walls was the only female officer of any rank to have ever served in the city of Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire for her entire tenure with the city of Pittsburgh. So we're definitely going to be looking for you to talk to us about that. And you are currently the co-chair of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, Women Women Chief. Yeah. Women Chiefs Council. Women yeah. Chief Council. Yeah. Along with is is uh, Chief Camelli, is it? Yeah. Yes, Mary. Is Mary Camelli. Yep, Chief Camelli. She's still the co-chair? Yes, she is. And you are a member of the IAFC Professional Development Committee still? Uh, no, they just um, revamped that entire um, process. So they combined two committees. And so uh, so I finished up my tenure with that in December. And they have the, the consolidation of two committees. I assume they will start in a, this month, actually. So, But I had a, I had a nice time on uh, productive service with that, and I enjoyed it. So... Do you know what PD combined with? Um, it was the. Uh, I think they're going to try and revamp the the um, the training section and also the um, conference uh, vetting committee. The planning um, committee. Yeah, the planning committee. Yeah. Right. So. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see what else we got. Colleen Walls is adjunct facilitator for the National Fire Academy curriculum. Executive Fire Service Program. We're definitely going to talk to you about that. Um, you hold a bachelor's degree in community and human service, and a master's degree in leadership with an emphasis in disaster preparedness and executive fire leadership. Where'd you get your master's degree? Uh, Grand Canyon. Gotcha. Yes. And you are a graduate of the EFO program because not everyone who teaches in the program is a graduate. So That's true. Yep. Um, and then, very interesting, in 2013, you were an Impact Center Fellow of the Women's Leadership Institute in Washington, D.C. Yes. What is that, Colin? Um, it is uh, a fellowship and training with women of actually many, many disciplines um, all across the country uh, that are in leadership positions. And they include lawyers and, and physicians, um, emergency room physicians, um, and we um, get together and we get mentors ourselves in order to try and move us forward in our career. And it was, for me, uh, a very meaningful experience in, in tenure with the Impact Center. And it's still going strong, as a matter of fact. So, um, But I was very, very proud to be a part of that. Excellent. It's not something that I've ever heard of, um, but it sounds very interesting. Yes. It was started under President Obama um, and just has you know, grown uh, with that in mind. So what we want to do, Colleen, is kind of have you talk to us a little bit about some of your unique fire service experiences. Um, what was it that drew you to the fire service? Um, well, it's interesting you ask. Uh, at that time, you know, uh, more important for me was to look for um, a career uh, that paid well and that paid benefits. Um, you know, and on the other side, you would hope that um, it was a job that you would enjoy going to work because that's extremely important. And it gets more and more important as you move on through your career. And I know you, you both can probably share that sentiment. 
But um, I started taking civil service exams and I took the police officer exam. That seemed more, uh, you saw many more women police officers, and particularly in my city at that time. And, um, and I was taking, you know, other civil service exams, competitive exams. And I decided to uh, sign up and test for City of Pittsburgh firefighter. I didn't know a whole lot about it at the time, but it looked exciting to me. Um, I didn't know at the time that there was only one woman in the City of Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire at that time. Um, so, but that was the original draw to the service. I was already involved with, um, you know, parks and recreation, was physically active, and um, I liked something different than sitting in an office, and this seemed to foot all that, foot that bill. So, so. Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire at that time, how big of a department are we talking about? Oh, when I came on the job, there was 1,032 members. Um, yeah, and 55, 55 uh, apparatus um, at that time. And one female. And one female. Her name was Tony McIntosh. So she actually, funny thing about that was she actually, um, because her name was Tony, they didn't realize that they were hiring uh, a, a female initially, but nothing they could do when they um when she showed up after she had taken all the physical exams and um and passed everything she did very well and and she was hired now is is tony someone that you looked up to as a mentor was she someone that helped you well mentally she helped me um i got to say you know tony come on the job in the uh mid 70s i want to say 1976 and when I come on the job in 1987, um, she, you know, she had had her share of um, issues um, and worked her way through it. So when I came on, she was uh, a, actually a driver or an engineer, as they would say, and she used to t uh, work on a tiller truck in the city. And I, in the very first week I was put out into the stations, I actually had the opportunity to work with her. But, you know, she was pretty standoffish. Um, and, you know, initially, I think that um, struck me as uh, hurtful, you know, because you would you would have thought maybe um, she would have embraced another woman. But I think in hindsight, you know, 30 years later, she probably thought she paid her dues and she didn't owe anybody anything. And um, and that's just the way she she um, made sure that she was uh, not going to be hurt again. Right. So, but that's the way, you know, I, 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 I rationalized it many years later. And I think that was probably, um, spot on. You know, it's interesting. Um, when we talk about some of the, the issues that we'll, I'm sure we'll get to, um, today talking about, um, inclusion in the fire service now, um, was there ever a time where you asked yourself why you were pursuing a job where there was no men? What did that look like? I, essentially, what I'm trying to get at is if there's somebody that's asking himself, uh, do I want to join the fire service? Uh, is that something that you ever got to a point where you, you second guessed or, or questioned whether or not you wanted to continue uh, either pursuing a job? Or once you got a job, continue employment. Um, I I would probably say hundreds of times, <laughs> you know. Um, and you know, those uh, it was an interesting synopsis of time in the U.S. fire service, particularly in the Northeast, um, where you had uh, very deeply rooted and entrenched uh, firefighters. Union firefighters. I mean, Pittsburgh was local one. Um, and so it was many of the same, for lack of a better term, growing pains going on in the Northeast in trying to diversify the ranks. And so obviously that was met with much resistance and much of that resistance was projected on the people who were causing the change in their right. eyes. So, right. um, so yeah, it was very, very difficult. Um, it was difficult. Then every step you take forward is not seen as um, a growth in your own um, 
in my mind, it was just a natural progression. I didn't see anything different with taking promotional exams, but in their minds, I many it was met as threats um, and threatened their positions, threatened their, um, and I don't know if it was threatening their machismo, but it definitely was a lot of that surrounding the fire service, particularly Northeast firefighters um, and particularly, you know, uh, union firefighters. And so it was, it was very, very difficult at times. I, I, I gotta say, um, I, I, many, many conversations I had with my father, my father, who was not a firefighter. Um, my husband's father was a firefighter, uh, retired before I ever got on a job, but, um, you know, and my husband and I didn't meet on the job, so it was also difficult for him. So there was many, many, um, many times I wondered, you know, was this okay for the family? Was this, um, should, what, what am I doing? Am I banging my head against the wall? Um, I take one step forward, two steps back. It seemed many times, um, every single time uh, I got promoted, it was met with resistance, sometimes more than others. Um, but, you know, the work, the actual work and responding and, and the guys that I work with on a regular basis, you know, we work like a fine tuned machine. But um, but it would seem like anybody on the outside looking in because there were so few women that not all of the firefighters even had the opportunity to work with women. And you mm -hmm. would have shifts like we had four shifts. You may or may not have one or two women working an entire shift across the city. So the chances that you know we would work together even were very slim so you know it was it was um it was interesting time let's say so you mentioned because i i didn't know this until last time we spoke your husband is on the job or was on the job in Pittsburgh. was on a job yeah before yes. you or after you uh three months before me <laughs> so yeah th three months before me yeah so, so you you met clearly and were married before yes and then yeah. both, both choose chose to pursue a career in the fire service you were were you changing careers like what was what was happening what that look well, like so um my husband was actually uh his father was a retired captain city of pittsburgh captain and his uncle was on the job also and actually his father was part and part part and parcel responsible advocating with many union members in order to have firefighters be hired by civil service and not by going to your local alderman and trying to get a job. So his father was actually part of um, getting civil service uh, hiring practices put into place so that there was actually a structure and a, and a structure a framework that they were supposed to follow. Um, so that being said, obviously, it was a more comfortable transition for my husband. However, you know, a lot was going on in the city um, during that period of time. The steel mills were crashing. Many people were without jobs. And so, um, the, you know, and the city was scaling down because the tax base was shrinking. So they were putting out hiring freezes. So we ended up taking the test and then they froze hiring in the city. So we had to wait a couple of years even to even get through the vetting process which um we both finally did so what were you doing at that at that point um i was actually working for parks and recreation for the city of pittsburgh um in parks or in swimming pools actually lifeguard swimming instructor and, okay and yeah. your, hus your husband was doing what he was working in a warehouse as a warehouseman uh, now defunct department store in the city of pittsburgh but he was he was a warehouseman Interesting. um yeah manual labor yeah so you get hired. What does your first month look like? What is your first? What What do you remember about that that initial time? Because we'll get into the promotions and stuff like that. But it 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 fascinates me, especially for me looking back uh, to to my beginnings. Uh, I had no I had no background in the fire service at all. What What did those those initial days, weeks, months uh, look like for you? Well, um, it's interesting. So going through Recruit Academy, um, at that time we were, you know, the city of Pittsburgh uh, was training firefighters to also become first responders, obviously medical. They weren't yet EMTs uh, at that time. So we had to go through a first responder program. And pretty much, you know, that for me was second nature since you have to know a lot of that for being a lifeguard. Um, the Recruit Academy 
um, I just found very, very challenging. And so um, that didn't phase me at all. I wasn't, wasn't afraid of heights. Um, I liked working on ladders. Um, you know, I have six sisters, so I have no brother. So my father always had me do all the <laughs> lawn work. My father taught me how to use all his tools. He had a tremendous workshop, luckily for me. Um, that definitely helped me out a ton um, and still does to this day. But um, so I had a little bit of that advantage. And I did try and, and help um, other women along, particularly in that aspect, because, you know, it was being, like being in a, in a, under a microscope for sure right. um, at that period of time. Um, there was a lot of going on. There was a lot going on across the country, particularly in, including women's hiring in Chicago actually was going through a lot of this also. And they were sharing a lot of um, information about, you know, how to how to slow down this hiring process of women. And some of that was filming them in recruit school every single move they made. Um, and they did that in Pittsburgh. And so if it's well, the first. I'm sorry. What was the purpose of doing that? Well, I can tell you what the what the what the what it ended up being is a, is a weapon used in court and when they terminated people. But and I think that you know many of the women knew that that potentially was an issue. Right. Um, what wasn't what wasn't clear and didn't come out until later was that a lot of those techniques that they were doing, like it would be the first time that a woman had ever picked up this tool or any man had picked up this tool. But unfortunately, or fortunately, they didn't film everyone. They didn't film all of the recruits. They only filmed some of the recruits. Right. Happened to be female. Um, and and then didn't qualify that, that this was the first time that they had ever particularly used this piece of equipment. So um, those were just some of the, and I, again, it's the fear-based tactics that were used in order to try and dissuade women from pursuing this career. Sounds so, like intimidation um, to me. Yeah, yeah you know, in, in, in legalese nowadays, that's exactly mm -hmm. what it would be considered. But it yeah. wasn't in the late eighties, no. um, unfortunately. Um, and and it was and it was actually, I mean, as far as um, a lot of the departments were concerned, it was it was fair game. You know, it was like a it was like a warfare, a game of warfare. Um, only the problem is, is that the the people that were taking the brunt of it were the were us in the stations and and then when the city came up with the idea that they would want to diversify the forces unfortunately they did not make sure that the um logistics or housing was diversified also right um so there were no women's bathrooms some of the stations only had one bathroom still um so that was an interesting um interesting logistical moves coming back from fires when you're supposed to be decontaminating or whatever. They either have to wait for me or I have to wait for all of them. Um, and that went on in stations all over the city with, you know, with many of the female firefighters. And unfortunately, it still goes on today. Um, so there's, that's still a work in progress. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh probably only has a handful of women now, but they do have finally two lieutenant women, women who are lieutenants. Um, very proud to say that, that they have finally uh, promoted a couple of women lieutenants in the last couple of years, but it wasn't until after I was gone for eight years. Um, but uh, yeah, it was interesting. Um, but I'll tell you, my very first, I came out of the academy and I can remember going to work in, in the field right before Christmas in 1987. And I was assigned to downtown Pittsburgh at the Boulevard of the Allies station, which was one of the original fire stations in the city of Pittsburgh. Still had the brass pole that came down through the floors. Um, and I just thought I was in heaven, you know. Well, you uh, were. So that's why. I, I did. Yeah. So I, I really did. So um, – so and we were riding the tailboards at that time, if you could believe that. So we were still riding the tailboards, and I was grinning ear to ear in downtown Pittsburgh in December. It was a smile on my face when we were going on runs on the tailboard. But I soon realized that you shouldn't do that because your teeth will freeze. Um, and your, my teeth got frozen like you were eating ice cream. So I finally realized that I better put the hose bed cover over my head when we went <laughs> otherwise my teeth were going to freeze um but yeah but i just thought i just thought that was the coolest thing ever so in hindsight i know that's not safe and we they no longer do that but but it was pretty cool so we we definitely did and in a lot of ways still do a lot of things that are not 
safe or advisable. I don't want to say smart. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. It's a value yeah, not judgment. Very, yeah, not very smart. You so, know? so there's a lot to your story, Colleen, and I want to hear all of it. But the question, as you're talking, the question that comes to my mind, um, not as a as a, a judgment question, but because I'm really interested interested in hearing your perspective on this, is why should why would you recommend the fire service to a female? If I had a a daughter at this point, what 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 is it about the fire service that you would uh, recommend that she pursue a career in the fire service? Or would you not? Well, um, so I'll qualify that. Uh, qualify that by saying not all fire um, departments are the same. Uh, so to this day, uh, they're not. I think that many fire departments have come much further in not only the, uh, the acceptance, because it's, it's more than acceptance, because it's it's a sense of belonging that everybody needs, not just women, but everybody on the diversity equity issue. So, you know, so some departments are far better in making sure that everybody belongs there. Um, and that not necessarily any of the departments that I, that I belong to or that I was in charge of. Um, so that being said, some of the, the greatest things about the fire service that it taught me, one, it tests, it tests you every day. Um, no day is the same, which is good and sometimes tragically bad, but um, you do have to take the good with the bad. Lasting lifelong relationships that I have, um, you know, many firefighters are as my family um, and close to me uh, like family, um, closer to me in many ways than family. Um, so those relationships, I can't, I can't even, I mean, there's, there, you can put a value on that. Um, but I really, I enjoyed helping people. M you know, many of us find, um, whatever it is that, that, that feeds your soul on taking care of others, um, is, is what we do well. It's what we rise to the occasion. Um, and I, I enjoyed all that. I enjoy being a part of that that type of community. So um, I hope that answered both sides of the question. Yeah, it, it um, certainly gives me a, a little bit of insight into into what, what you enjoyed about the service. I am a little curious to know, and you can either choose to be specific or not. Um, what is a department that is doing it right doing that makes it right? Um, I think that what makes it right is uh, making sure that people know they are valued um, and that their skill sets are valued and they're valued as, as what they bring to the service. You know, um, in watching many of the firefighters in the field and in going into um, rural South Carolina, um, you really, you really, in the city of Pittsburgh, in all the neighborhoods, 88 neighborhoods in the city of Pittsburgh, um, lovingly, you know, have nicknames of where they are. But being able to have uh, people available that connect uh, with these people that allows you to do your job better, um, you know, that's that's what that's what a department does well. If they can ma make sure all the pieces fit together and everybody feels belong and they can touch the community with that um, with that in mind, to me, that's a win. You know, I. I and I could be wrong, but I always thought that, you know, um, out West, they were doing it far better than we were doing on the East Coast and in the Rust Belt with um, because of the tradition. And everybody was so entrenched in all of that, that they didn't feel like they had to grow or do anything different because they thought they were doing it all right. Right. You know, so. But, so what, what does feeling valued look like well um it it's it's the ability to um go into work knowing that you know someone is going to listen listen to what you have to say and i think that younger people now probably 
um, the next generations after ours probably do it far better than we do, or they don't tolerate not being listened to. Um, you know, some of the complaints of um, the newer generations are that, um, you know, we don't we don't listen to what they have to say, or they're they're not going to be told because they can Google it. Well, I am a lot of that's true. We blindly followed and did, you know, lockstep and everything else. They yeah. have, they do have emotions. They are going to let you know. They are going to ask questions, and you know, and we need to listen. And I think that being valued is being heard. Um, and and even if you have a different point of view, you can still work together as a team. Right. Um, my point always was, you know, you don't have a right to ruin my day. I don't, I'm not going to change your mind about what you feel, you know, but you don't have a right to ruin my day. We don't have a right as a service to ruin somebody's day just because they're different. Um, what they bring to the service many times is invaluable um, and you can see it in the street. Um, so, I mean, that goes with all different uh diversity issues in the fire service that we seem to try to not to want to deal with them. Um, I, you know, like uh, I tag on to that or, or ask a little more clarification. Two of the departments sure. I've been on are diabetically opposed. The one where I was chief, we absolutely embraced females. We had several females, probably had more females in Pittsburgh division fire or bureau fire, whatever they call it. Um, not a great, not a great stretch, Michael. They had whatever two. it's called. Anyway, <laughs> Uh, but the other department I was on has never had a female. And one of the things when you said that they listen, does it, if you walked into a station and they showed you where the women's locker room was and the women's restrooms were and how we have separate bedrooms, how everything, the, the, the lack of doing any accommodation whatsoever is almost like a, to me, a flashing sign of get out or you're not welcome. And, Absolutely. And it, I know it sounds dumb, but is that yeah? So, so even though it's a physical thing, it's also if you listened, you would have done this and yep. taken care of that person. Good, thank you. Absolutely, That's, that is such a a big indicator to me that if you don't, if you're doing what you say you're doing, you show <laughs> me you're actually doing it. Don't just talk about it. Show me, you know, listen what they need and provide them what they need, and uh, you'll get a completely different attitude when you go in there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and like I said, unfortunately, that's still going on today. All the time. Um, all the time. And um, in the same in the same issues. And it, yeah. the same issues have been involved in litigation. And you would think. Yeah. Uh, for 50 years, because their females have been trying to get in the fire service, like you said, since the 70s. Yep. Yes, yep. for 50 years. Still so, doing it. Um, yeah. It's very, very frustrating. And it is. It's more or less, won't you just flash a sign? You're not welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the way it feels. Because that's the way it is. Crazy. It was crazy. Interesting. Uh, in in my fire department where I worked, I want to say the first the first female was hired halfway through my career. For perhaps we didn't have a lot, had a few, um, and I I I definitely can't say that we did a great job with it. Um, but I may not necessarily be the the person to ask. Uh, asking the female would be a better way of doing that. Uh, we had issues with uh, restrooms and, and stuff like that. One of the things that came up recently, uh, before I forget, because I will, um, uh, we're all of a, a certain age, policy. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm mater- even with my pad and pencil, I will forget. I think he's uh, actually the youngest mater- of all of us. <laughs> I think he is too. Yeah, yeah. A, mater- a maternity policy. Yes. Uh, did your department have a maternity policy? And um, if, if so, what was it? Uh, the city of Pittsburgh did not when I came on. Um, they did uh, about after I had my second son, um, because luckily um, the union did finally step in and um, and fight for that. Uh, it was a double-edged sword. They were actually looking for injured off the job too, light duty programs, but they were willing to settle for light duty policy for um, pregnant female firefighters. So they did step forward with that. When I got down to St. John's, the policy was there, um, but it, inadequate. Um, and we did a lot of revamping of that in addition to adding um, lactation refrigerators and things like that to, to where we needed them to be. Um, 
but you know that comes and goes too so um just kind of move it from station to station however i will say you know that my time in in st john's i was had the opportunity and the resources to build uh, at least a few fire stations and all of those fire stations had individual bunk rooms and obviously in a uh, bathroom separate right. facilities for right. for women and men and Which there were men... more women unfortunately sad to say there were more women in st john's fire um at 126 personnel than there were in the city of pittsburgh yeah. so interesting what was um what was it like to be pregnant with your first your first child two boys right I have two sons, yeah. So you're, you're pregnant. You are. Tell me, where are you in your career at this point? Uh, when I was, well, I had my first son before I got on the job. I had my second son while I was on the job. Okay. Um, gotcha. I got pregnant uh, as I was a firefighter in my third year. Um, there were no um, provisions for pregnant female firefighters. I didn't have enough time uh, together to be able to be off. Uh, take the time off once I found out I was pregnant in order to have the six weeks le after delivery postpartum. So um, I I didn't tell anybody I was pregnant and my husband swore my husband to secrecy and myself <laughs> to secrecy. Um, I told one firefighter who I was very close to, um, who I worked with on a regular basis. He was the engineer on my shift or driver um, only because I was worried that if anything ever happened, um, I would like somebody to know. And um, so um, we went for many months um, without telling anyone. And I was able to get a bigger set of bunker pants. But, you know, I didn't know then what we know now, um, you know, that a lot of that is actually hazardous to the fetus in, in addition to fighting fire. Right. Um, but but even bunker pants um, are dangerous with the entrapment of heat, particularly in the first trimester. All the things that we know about women not going into hot tubs, um, we didn't know then. Um, and so because it was just still so new. So it was a very odd time, you know, not being able to share that kind of joy information, you know, that we're, you know, expecting our second son and really couldn't say anything because it just financially you know, it would have crushed us. And, and, um, so, um, that's the, that's the route we took, um, in order for us to be able to have our second child. So, but after I had my son, Garrett, both of my sons are firefighters too, by the way. Yeah. Um, so Figures. yeah, that's not my well, choice, of but course they are. <laughs> yeah, I know, but that's not my choice, but, um, but I didn't have a choice. Um, it should be doctors but, and uh, lawyers, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, um, so, uh, but, um, you know, that is exactly why we fought so hard after I had my second son to make sure that there were policies in place so that women weren't put into that position. And, um, and uh, it, you know, because in hindsight, it was, you know, pretty stupid. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is what we had to do at the time, we felt anyway. So I'm a fire chief. Where can I go? to get information about the, cause you, you, you just mentioned about uh, wearing bunker pants, heat, first trimester, hot tubs. I don't know any of this stuff. Where, where does a fire chief go to, to find out how to do this stuff? I mean, you're involved in a, in a lot of different uh, women's leadership type of uh, organizations. Yes. Where, so, a good, good, really good question. Um, and I wish that all fire chiefs were asking some of those questions. So in, in 1990, I got on a job in 87. In 1990 is when I had my second son. Um, in 1991 or two is when I found out about it. It used to be at that time women in the fire service. Then it went into WFS. And now it's women in fire. Right. Um, they were actually the, the, the depot of trying to gather as much information about women firefighters across the country. Um, they were actually the first resource um, in order to, and I, did, I found out about them by accident. Now you have to remember at this time, we didn't have internet then. We didn't have computers. There was right. no, and everything came out in booklet form, papers, newsletters came out in newsletters, um, you know, and, and I found out about them and I joined that organization and it was a, a wealth of information about all kinds of things, you know, um, 
the the issues of uh, pregnant women, the issues of uniforms, the issues of bunker gear that wouldn't fit, um, haircuts because many fire departments were using extreme haircuts for women to get them to go off the job, Pittsburgh included, um, until we fought for that um, in order to make sure that we could grow our hair. And um, so a lot of those things, um, women in fire really helped me out with the city a lot, but helped up many women across the country. And then, you know, as we go on, move forward, you know, you had people like Dr. Lori Moore Merrill, who then started working for the IFF on uh, medical issues. And finally, now they're doing research on women. You know, what are the effects of the toxic uh, exposures and smoke exposures to women and fertility? Because we know there are issues with men and fertility. Um, we know, you know, the chemicals, we don't, but we don't know what cancers affect women or what cancers affect men. So a lot of that research being conducted and thankfully Dr. Lori Moore Merrill um, has really pushed a lot of that forward. Um, can you even imagine the time we're in now? I mean, I couldn't even think about that in 1987 or 1988. I mean, I couldn't even see this as even a possible um, outcome, you know, 30 years down the road. But I'm really glad it is. I wish we were further, but we're not. But I wish we were. Agreed. Agreed. <clears throat> Do you think that some of the issues that you just mentioned, fertility and things like that, uh, are are barriers to women? wanting to be in the fire service or do you think uh that it's it's more of the the culture uh the cultural issues that we were talking about a couple minutes ago well so let's think about this and we go back 35 years i think that if um that if the conditions were properly in place to um embrace and 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 uh grow women firefighters then the exposure to other young people would have been much greater than it is now unfortunately many of the stories ended up bad um there were many uh you know, lawsuits obviously all of the bad press doesn't help but women have a lot more opportunities and options now than they had in 1987 1988 um uh, so i think that there are a lot more fields out there they can go to why would you go to something like firefighting where in many departments they still don't have their act together yeah so even if you thought this was an exciting career which i did and i still believe um firefighting was the easiest part of my entire tenure in the fire service to, to be honest <laughs> the actual job was the easiest part um the rest of it was <laughs> put the wet stuff so on the red stuff or you know exactly open up a roof. yes absolutely break, break you know, out that window up. yeah yeah you know because we started with axes we didn't have chainsaws right yeah. off the rip we, it took a couple years before we got those but yeah. um but you know i mean so i think that that Barriers were put in place that even thwarted the growth of diversity in the fire service more than it is now. Again, particularly on the East Coast, because I just don't, maybe because I didn't experience that. I just didn't, it just didn't seem to me that they were having the, the trouble that we were having on, on, the, on the East Coast. I'm going to ask a question. I've been thinking about it all day, and I said, I hope this rolls off my tongue the way I want it to. <laughs> I just, I can't wait. I can't That's wait for waiting. him to say something yeah, inappropriate. I'm just waiting for him to say something inappropriate. It wouldn't yeah. be the first dumb thing I said today. Yeah. How far away from your mouth is your foot? <laughs> yeah. as, as, as a female firefighter, fire officer, fire chief, what is the value of diversity in the fire service. Oh, geez, it's it's really hard to um, it's really hard to put a value on. But I guess you know you think about it in terms of um, what is the value of of um, and I'm not going to say some of the cliche things that people say. Oh, you know, women on medical calls um, are are much. Um, a much better asset than men, and I don't necessarily believe that. Um, in some instances, they are. Um, in some religions, they are. It's very, very nice that you go into a religion where um, they only see female doctors. You know, no other men is supposed to see their wife. That you have a woman, a team member there, obviously exceptional. But 
you know, I go back to my tenure in, in uh, South Carolina where um, you have uh, the islands, Walmart Island, I'll say, uh, for example, where you have the um, people who are descendants of slaves, a very, very, uh, still very, very huge network family, very religious, but very distrustful of anybody in uniform that comes onto the island. Um, the fact that you would have people there from the island, from Wabala, um, that are family members in order to go on these calls, you know, establishes a level of trust with the community, not only that, that what they're saying is true and right, but that they're doing the same job as us and that we're working together as a team. Um, I, you know, I, I can't, I don't even know how you would put a monetary price on that or a value on that. Right. Um, but that's what people see and how the community really puts the value on that. Um, you know, some people say, and, and, and this is hard for me to argue because, you know, teaching at the national fire Academy, you meet people from all over the country and sometimes the world and in the smallest departments and the largest departments and some, you know, their, their department, is the makeup of their community, which many times is predominantly white um, and or or male. Um, so they obviously can't see the value in diversity up until it comes time when the crap hits the fan and you, sh you know, and you should have been had it or you would have been better off with it um, or you wouldn't open your mouth and insert your foot. Um, I don't think that if if you've never experienced it, then you can't see the value of diversity. Right. Um, but when you've seen it in action, geez, you think, oh, my gosh, you know, I thank God they were here. I thank God they were here. You know, then. Um, I think that last part sums it up so perfectly. As soon as you experience the diversity, you recognize the diversity. Yeah, and absolutely. One of the things that drove me nuts was there was always this strength and unity kind of a perspective. And yeah, as a team, we work together in unity as a team. However, what makes up that team the more diverse in every way, the better that whole team will be because you get so many varied perspectives and backgrounds and people that can relate. And if you can have the perfect panacea where your department matches your community, I mean, I don't know how many places there are you get attacked. <laughs> I just, uh, it's a B. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know it, where it came from. But it makes me think of that whole concept. Like, it, it's almost like you will learn far more about the world by seeing the world. Yeah. Go travel, yes. go overseas. You actually go, if you're Italian from the U.S. and then you go to Italy, you realize there's all kinds of Italian. Yeah. You because know, the, the American Italian is one thing. And, you know, <laughs> Or Laurel Bill. Go easy, Benton. <laughs> yeah, but no, but seriously, I had no idea that Northern Italy and Southern Italy had a civil war, and they oh. are like North and South of the U.S., and yeah. they don't even speak the same version of Italian. It, they have, it's almost like dialects, and then all the little city states. There's all this background to things, and you realize, no, there's that's not pasta in the north. That's risotto in the north. <laughs> it's it's just so cool to. Like, I think you summed it up so perfectly with when you see it, then you'll understand it. But if you never see it, yes. never understand it. Yeah, and, and like I said, there are some guys that go through their entire careers that just mm -hmm. never been in a position to see it. So yeah. they can't see what the problem is. And right. Exactly. Everything's fine. What's wrong? Yeah. <laughs> That's why we've been exactly. doing it forever. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, well, there's definitely a, a lot of facets to, to diversity. I was kind of asking the question to to elicit a response from your perspective, clearly a perspective that I don't have, uh, and I think that that is a part of diversity is is experiencing people that may have uh, thoughts, opinions, knowledge, experiences, uh, backgrounds, whatever the case may be, that are different than yours. I I ran into that in the military. I joined the military after the fire department. Uh, but it was a great example for me of working with people that had different backgrounds, come from different uh, different upbringing, different life experiences, different values, uh, but common goal. And what that does, what the what what having the common goal does is make you focus on the goal. So sometimes what I Sometimes what I 
do or think is that the fire service may be lacking the goal. Uh, what what is the goal, right? Is it is it mm -hmm. to just respond to the next call that's coming in? Like what are, what are we actually trying to do uh, as a service? Are, are are we trying to to move forward, uh, or are we just waiting for the next call to come in? Uh, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that or not. Well, so some of the questions, and, and, and just to get kind of what you're saying is, um, unfortunately, many administrations, when they set diversity and they set goals, I don't know what they're looking for either, um, because they don't know what they're looking for. Uh, if if you're just looking for a certain set of number, or you're looking for so many faces that look like this, or so many backgrounds that look like this, or so many genders that look like this, um, I, I think that's unrealistic. Um, but if the goal is to truly diversify the service with strong people, um, I think that doesn't have a number on it, you know, yeah. um, but a sense of belonging. And I don't think many departments know yet what the goal is. It isn't, it isn't just, you know, diversity for diversity's sake. We have a set number we got to reach and you're doing it poorly or you fail. Um, it is, it, it is, it is much more than that. Um, so it, it, it's hard to, it's hard to put a, a, a definition for that, Michael, if that makes sense to you. It does. And I, and I think, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this is um, if, you know, the cliche things that you hear is two, two things that firefighters hate change and when things stay the same. That's right. Uh, and and to, to change things for the sake of change is not, I, I don't fear change. Um, I fear some things, but change is, is not necessarily one of them. Uh, but change for, for just for the sake of changing things, doesn't make any sense to me. So it, it over time, caused me to ask, what are we actually trying to do? Um, okay. So as uh, the the document that was printed a couple of years ago about the the twenty first century fire service talked about mentorship and reverse mentorship in there. It was actually I actually used that document. Uh, to create a presentation that, that I did a couple times. And um, it was a big part of, of us putting together a, mentor, a podcast on mentorship, right? Which is about taking the lessons that you learned and Michael learned and Rob learned and, and hopefully giving them to people so that they can move us forward. Well, where where is forward? Is forward just in time? Or are we moving forward as a fire service uh, in terms of uh, a new and better direction. I'm not so sure. So, okay. Um, I think that you're definitely right. People, firefighter, they fear change. Um, a lot of that I think they fear is a loss that ch the change will bring. Um, a loss of whatever, what was their comfort, you know, um, a loss of, everything they knew um, because with change they associate it with a loss right um, so so that's part of the whole um, resistance um, I don't think change for change sake is beneficial either um, but uh, I think that it does bring about growth and uh, if you're looking for growth in your department, um, change has to happen. It's, I mean, it's it's a part of life. That was one of the things I told my son, don't get comfortable where you are because one thing is for sure about the fire service, things will change. And so you're gonna have to be able to adapt. So don't go into a station thinking, this is the greatest thing through sliced bread. I have an officer, I don't wanna go anywhere. You know, this is great yeah. because it will change. And, um, and you know. Yeah, I, I remember very vividly um, my mentor telling me change is going to happen around you, so you're better off being a part of that change than having it happen and you're left behind, 
right. Which, which was a big part of my promotional process. So I will ask you as a kind of a segue, um, what was it that you remember uh, that caused you to say, I want to be an officer? <laughs> well, <laughs> funny you should ask. No. <laughs> um, so just as you probably, so I didn't have any really uh, – people to say, oh, let me take you by the hand. I'm going to yeah. show you, you know, whatever. Um, that didn't happen. However, um, I did see um, specific actions from officers that I really thought, wow, you know, this was really good, whether it had been an HR issue um, or on-scene command issue or whatever. And I always thought, you know, um, I, I want to remember that, you know, put that in. I want to remember that because I hope that if I'm in the position, I can think that quickly on my feet or I can do that. On the flip side of that off, obviously, is some of the worst things you've ever seen an officer do. You would say, I will never be like that, or I will never treat someone that way, or I will never say these things, or I will never make an action without consulting um, the rest of my group and right. saying, uh, this is what I see. What do you see? Right. I mean, I still have to make a decision, but tell me what you see. Um, maybe you see something that I don't. Um, that is... Um, and that served me very well. I um, So that being said, I didn't have in my mind that this wasn't a natural thing, that this was not a natural progression for me. Um, so I couldn't figure out why everybody had a problem with it because it seemed perfectly normal to me. Right. The, when the exams came up, you sit for the exams, you take the exams and, you know, um, and if you test well and it never, you know, you – you get promoted, but it was a big, big issue. But um, I worked a lot, so it became my career, my hobby, firefighting, because I knew that if I was going to try and move up the ranks, that not only was it, were we a fishbowl as a firefighter, but then it was going to be probably twice as bad as an officer, and it was. But um, I used to train on the weekends with the volunteers, and I became a fire instructor. Um, with the volunteers and got uh, became a state certified fire instructor for the for the Pennsylvania State Fire Academy while I'm in this process because I wanted to make sure that I was ready and that if you know the issues came up that I was under a microscope I could you know defend or um be able to act on my feet and um and that served me very well um and and those people and those connections actually served me throughout my career uh truly um when i made lieutenant captain battalion chief deputy chief um all of those uh reaching out to all of those individuals paid tenfold on on the way up and people that i would never forget you know so people that didn't realize sometimes they were mentoring because i was paying attention right. um ended up being mentors so what is an example of something that you saw that you said, I want to do that? And then what's an example of something that you saw that you said, I ain't never doing that? <laughs> you mean as far as being an officer? Yeah, you said that you saw certain uh, officers doing it right or wrong or you know, in, in your in your mind. Well, um uh, there's 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 actually tons, Michael, so we don't have time for that. But I will tell you one that really stands out in my mind for crass behavior of a upper level officer on the scene of a deadly fire. Um, it was uh, it was right after I made captain, actually. And um, and the assistant chief came to the fire and was a fatal fire on the side of Mount Washington which is a huge hillside that goes up the city. You'll see it many times. And when they pan over to city of Pittsburgh Steeler games where the incline goes up to the top, it was um, a, a structure in, on the side of a hill. And so it was treacherous to get to, but, um, and they were all frame homes built 200 years ago. So we were coming down from the hillside. We saw it was a flaming frame just on the side of the hillside. And everybody just thought, God, you know, we hope nobody's in there because if they are, they're gone. And there were two. Okay. There was two fatals. And the procedure at that time was that the first due company would have to do, you know, uh, body um, retrieval. 
Yeah. And um, we weren't the first two company, but I did have another woman working with me that day. And um, the assistant chief come over to us both. And we were actually the fourth company, fourth engine in at that time. And he comes over to me and says, um, you guys ever see a dead body? And I said, yes, I have. And she said, no, I haven't. He said, get the body bags off the truck. You guys are going in to get these bodies. And I just thought and said a whole lot of swear words in my head. Um, and um, And I just thought, you know... You are the biggest, dumbest um, person, rockhead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if I ever got to this position, um, you know, I, that it would be it would have been quite different. Um, right. But um, it was just but interesting to me. Here's what was interesting to me. Two fellow firefighters stepped up and said, we're going in with them, and they they went in with uh, this firefighter and myself. And um, but the first do engine didn't do anything. Yeah. Not not one of the four didn't do a thing. Didn't lift a finger. And it was their, and it was their fire. Basically, their fire. They owned it. It was yeah. their first do. Their first yeah. district. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting. It spoke volumes about them. Their Agreed. officer, Agreed. and it spoke volumes about the uh, commanding officer who made that decision. So I just thought, if I ever get into a position like that, you know, um, God, you got to have some kind of morals, values, something, something has to kick in that says this is terribly wrong, you know. But it didn't. Be so, before I ask you about getting promoted, I, I'm really I want you to commit for me of the hundreds of things that you saw, what was one thing that really stood out to you as something that you saw as a positive attribute of uh, someone in a position of leadership? Oh, um, I'll tell you his name is Captain Timmy Westwood. He was, um, he was, I had one of my very first fires with uh, Captain Westwood. I was working in the Hill District in the city of Pittsburgh. And I think we talked about this before. Hill District is where Hill Street Blues came from. Oh, is that was, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, very, uh, in the city, the part, that part of the city, Hill District, um, it was um, in various uh, times of disarray and, you know, burning, basically. But I had one of my very first fires with uh, Captain Westwood, and he was just very um, – he explained everything we were going to do, uh, told us everything we were going to do. And, and we were actually notified of the fire. A lady comes screaming on the on the engine door in the middle of the night, and the fire was right across from the station. And uh, so we went flying over, and we got dressed. He said, this is what we're going to do, whatever. We went, we went up the steps, and um, – Opened the door, backdraft it. We went rolling down, rolling down the steps, um, and we got back up and we went right back up and right back in. Um, but he forgot to put his gloves on because we were in a hurry. She kept saying her baby was in there, her baby was in there. Um, so he forgot to put his gloves on. He burned his hands tremendously, and I can remember after that telling me, you know, sitting down with me saying, you know. This is what we did. This is what I did. I said, wrong. Don't ever do this. Um, this is why. Um, even if they say that, um, it ends up her baby was 300 pounds and 35 years old, and he went out the back fire escape that they had put on the building <laughs> about five years prior, but no one knew. But um, but he was just a tremendous teacher um, as well as an officer. I mean, he was very he was very. Uh, very calculated and knew exactly what he wanted to do. And he's very, very good about it. And, um, and, uh, and even afterwards in the critique, it was amazing to me. And I've got to tell you, not all officers were good at giving directions leading in and or the after action critique. He was, he was excellent at it all as at it all. So, um, but a very, very good officer. My excellent. opinion. So how long before you get promoted? 
Oh, um, I got promoted. I say I came on in 87. Um, I got promoted to lieutenant, but there was a big court battle um, over the city and, um, and, and promotions that during that time because the, they wanted to cut uh, companies, which they did. So I went from lieutenant to captain pretty quickly after they finally moved through that litigation. And um, I actually got promoted to lieutenant officially um, the day before Bryceland Street Fire, um, February 13th. Uh, 1995 and Bryceland Street was February 14th, 1995. Yeah. So. So we talked. We talked about Bryceland Street last time we spoke. Mm-hmm. Tell us about Bryceland Street from your perspective, Mike. Do you uh, familiar with Bryceland Street? Is this the fatal that was the house where there was a lot of basements below it? Or was this a different yes. one? Yes. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um. It, yeah, as I had said, you know, there's one thing about Pittsburgh, very, very hilly, and Bryceland Street was a residential structure fire built into the side of a hill. Um, Murphy's Law basically was anything that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, so the front of the house looked like two-story. The back of the house was actually four-story. Um, so um, they thought they were uh, – in one area of the house and they weren't. And so access or egress exit was, um, limited when they went through the house. Um, my good friend, Patty Conroy and, uh, um, a deputy chief's son. Um, and, um, I'm trying to think, and another and another firefighter all went down and they were all unconscious. Um, Eddie Nemeth, and it was another captain who went down. Tommy Brooks was the other captain who passed away. And uh, it um, it really shook the fire department to the core because it was a residential structure fire. And just like that, we had lost three people when we actually had almost lost three more. Um, but it just was. It was Murphy's Law because there was a radio tower out and the communications were not good in that area to begin with because up into the hillsides. A hose burned through that was their entrance hose, uh, Tommy Brooks and Mark Kalenda, who was the son of a deputy chief. Their hose burned through. Air cylinders ran out. Um, apparently there were issues. Um, carbon monoxide intake. Um with the um, MSA masks and stuff that they were wearing. And um, and people in positions that weren't normally in the positions. The BC, the regular BC who would have been command was on another call. Um, so, yeah, it was it was devastating. It was what time of day? Uh, it came in shortly after midnight on February 14th. Right. Shortly after midnight. And um, I was listening to the fire at home on my scanner because I told you, firefighting then became my hobby and my – and um. And I was listening to it and I knew, I knew my good friend Patty was probably there, but I didn't think that she was on 17 engines because she was normally assigned to eight. And, um, but she was on 17 that night because she was sent, um, a, as a, a, a fill in because they were missing personnel because a couple of people had bid out, uh, two weeks prior, they had bid to another station. So they had vacancies. So she was sent there as to fill a spot as well as Mark Lenda was sent there to fill a spot. So they were two other firefighters working with Tommy Brooks that night. And, um, because, um, one of them was actually my brother-in-law who had just bit out. Um, and, uh, so, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, um, pretty devastating, devastating for the city. Um, chief Charlie Dickinson was the fire chief at the time. They didn't have NIOSH at that time. So, they did have – the federal government had paid for a whole white paper research to be done on that fire, which you can still get at, you know, at the National Fire Academy. Yeah. And um, going over a lot of those lessons, you know, um, we had we had uh, manual pass devices at the time. They didn't have their pass devices turned on. Right. So locating them was very, very difficult. That was the dawn of, of the integrated pass device was born out of that tragedy. Um, thank goodness. Um but yeah, a lot of lessons, a lot of lessons learned. Um, yeah, very, very difficult. Patty was, um, her father was a retired police officer 
and uh, Patty's grandparents were uh, Irish immigrants, and her aunts all spoke with the Irish brogue. Um, you know, because I had I had um, been over to her family home many times. You know, and uh, so it was um, very very difficult. I remember uh, Crawford. What's what's his first name? Jimmy. Jim Crawford. Yep. Uh, had used Bryson Street uh, as kind of the uh, the catalyst for the rap intervention movement. So I was in kind of tasked with writing some of the, the curriculum policy. Uh, that was actually my introduction to the National Fire Academy in 2002 was to go down there and write uh, a course. I took fire service course design and um, learned a lot about Bryson Street and, and rep intervention was, was kind of emerging at that time. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say one of the things that I, I still um, I like to hear, um, particularly with Bryson Street, is that um, people are still learning lessons from, from that fire. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are still the hard way, um, but there's still so much to be learned from not only Bryson Street, but, but all of the fate of fires that we uh, have that have been investigated. Um, but uh, the one thing thing that really strikes me about the Bryceland Street Fire, because NIOSH was not yet born um, of that idea, because the IAF really petitioned to have a, an investigative unit that such as NIOSH, and it was after several, several fires um, between 94 and 95, where many firefighters, multiple firefighters were dying yeah. in fires, um, that this came about, but the, the just the whole way that chief charlie dickinson handled that like we're at, transparent we're going to be whatever happens it happens here we're just you know the good the bad the ugly we're just going to go through it all because that's what they deserve and that's what uh, everybody who would left deserves you know so um i really did appreciate particularly later on when ebenezer church occurred how well he, charlie had handled that fire because um, he handled it very well, we're gonna as get, well as could be expected from a fire chief in that in that position. We're going to get to Ebenezer Church here shortly, but being that you mentioned it, I guess uh, it's shortly. <laughs> you you said that you're glad that people are still learning the lessons of Bryson Street. We're learning learning lessons from. What did you What did you learn from Bryson Street? Oh, um, well, it used to be at that time that the officer took the line in, so they were on the nozzle, and that was just the way they did it in Pittsburgh because that's why you became an officer is you got yeah. to go to the nozzle. Well, um, you to got to Clifton, you know, New Jersey, same thing. Yeah, I mean, that's the way it was. Yeah. Directly after that is when the uh, officer went behind yep. so that he could watch the crews, still watch the scene as much as they could uh, at 360. Um the importance of the safety unit, accountability was used, um, radio checks, uh, checking on your people uh, after a certain amounts of time. All of those things that we learned, you know, having dispatch do a PAR check. No one even knew what PAR meant did or did PAR checks prior to that. Um, it was so much freelancing that went on. Um, and a lot of that uh, was put under control. What I learned was... Now I was an officer and I was responsible now for other people, not just me. And, um, and I took that very seriously. Yeah. Um, I always felt like if I was going to have to explain to someone, a wife or a husband, um, the actions that I made that, you know, may have, um, contributed to or whatever, if I, really made stupid decisions. Um, and I'm not the one to say that I didn't make stupid decisions. I think in hindsight, many times I look over some of the things that my company and I did and I think, Oh my gosh, what was I thinking? Yeah. And, but, um, but it really put that presence in mind that, you know, you are responsible and you're going to have to answer to, to what you do. And, uh, you know, I think I'm having the same 
reaction, I guess, as, as last time we spoke. Um, my first fire, my, my first burning building was a burning building. We didn't do live fire training when I got hired. We didn't go to a formal fire academy. Um, and, and that's not meant to be, um, it's not meant to be a criticism. It's just what we did. But I didn't have any experience. Some of the people came on were volunteers, whatever the case may be. And we went to a fire on a Saturday morning. And I quit that day. But the problem was, is that the senior firefighter behind me pushed me back into the building. If he wasn't there, I would have walked over to the fire, uh, the deputy turned my helmet in and said, I'm done. Because I'd never been in a situation like that. Right. Uh, long story short, uh, one of the firefighters got went in. It was a split level. So there were like five or six different levels of the house. Went in. Uh, and got separated, room flashed. He got caught, jumped out the window, never came back. Um, he didn't die. He he did die eventually uh, from a cardiac condition, but not at this fire. But the reason why I say any of this stuff was because that was my first fire, and I thought I killed him because <laughs> I was told by my officer at the time to take the hose line and put it in the basement window. and. Of all the things I learned in in um, the fire academy, if you want to call it that, was not to put a line in the window, right? Not not to get into mm. any of the modern fire environment or any of that stuff. That's what we were told. And mm. I remember walking around the front of this house and watching the fire flash. I could see it, and seeing Dan run over with the ladder to get Paul. Paul was the guy who never came back. Uh, the fact that he didn't die made it okay i felt i processed as a young firefighter as everything was okay and i when when you told the story last we spoke and as you're telling it now i think back to how that impacted me in terms of take take it seriously you know uh -huh. perhaps too seriously some might say I might say, um, but it's a serious business. The not everybody comes back. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you had more than one of these type of incidents in your career is, um, and you, you're not the only one, but that's not mm -hmm. the point. The point is, is that some people never experience that and and better that they don't um how did how did that how did that affect you if you could if you could share that what, what was the impact of of that having people that you knew not come back um so uh i was a pallbearer for patty um Patty, like I said, I knew her family, I knew her sisters, I knew her fiance. Um, that was it was that was that was devastating to me. Um, and then Mark Kalenda's son. I mean, my neither one of my sons were um, on the job at that time, um, and I had never thought they would be. Uh, so obviously, the impacts of that. Continued throughout my career, and then as my older son got on the job while I was still on with the city, um, obviously those are haunting. They didn't speak about PTSD at that time; that wasn't even a thing. I am sure that me and many others um, lived through that. Um, but it definitely, because I was a young officer, it definitely opened my eyes. Uh, uh, as to what the possibilities were and the potential and then watching what the families that were left behind went through uh was just was just dreadful um and i think that was torturous in and of itself because it wasn't just us as a department trying to work through this um and having a supportive chief that tried to work through us we were watching these families go through uh just a nightmare 
um, uh, you know, when all the pomp and circumstance was finally done, all the fit flashy parades and, and all of that. And then they were left with um, just emptiness. Yeah. And um, it, it, it wreaked havoc, it wreaked havoc on, on me personally, but um, I, on the whole department. And then nine years later to go through that again with Ebenezer was um, senseless and um, tragic, tragic beyond beyond compare. I think in in that respect. So Ebenezer was the church. Yes. And you were a chief officer at this time. I was. Um, I had just been promoted battalion chief. Uh, a few months prior, and I was assigned to the training academy, which was a good fit for me, even though um, uh, that's not how it was supposed to have been, but that's how it turned out, because I guess um, that's how things went in the city <laughs> at that time. Yeah. But since I was already a fire instructor for the state, and um, um, it was a good fit for me at that time. And then after Ebenezer, it also worked out well. But um, uh, because the deputy chief, on duty, uh, they had four four uh, suppression deputy chiefs and then one administrative deputy chief. Normally, if it went into multiple alarms, the deputy chief on duty obviously would respond. He would respond on the second alarm, and the administrative deputy would respond after they knew it was a working structure fire. But after a, 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 such a large scale building, they should have responded right away. Right. Um, but the deputy chief was on disability, so. I was sent in his spot um, to go on uh, the next alarm after a backdraft occurred in the basement of Ebenezer Church. And that was the initial call because initially the pastor called in the fire. It was just smoke coming from an outlet in the basement breakfast room. And it didn't seem like much of a big deal. And that was about nine o'clock in the morning on the day of the St. Patrick's Day in the city of Pittsburgh. Oh, is that and right? St. Patrick's Day. It absolutely was. And it's, it's Pittsburgh has one of the largest St. Patrick's Day parades in the country. And the Ebenezer Church was just two streets away from the lineup of the parade. It was in the edge of the Hill District where I started my career in the Hill District. Ebenezer Baptist Church was uh, Martin Luther King had gone there to speak. Um, you know, so it was a very revered uh, church in the Hill District, stained glass windows, and had this huge uh, uh, stone uh, steeple that went yep. up. Uh, and um, the fire burned for quite some time after the backdraft, and guys were hurt and blown off the building, and a couple were burned with backdraft, is when they put in the next alarm. And the safety officer at that time was uh, Chief Charlie Brace, who was one of my very first captains when I came on the job in the Hill District. He was actually my second captain in the Hill District. He was the um, safety officer, and the deputy chief was in charge of the fire. Well, because this was right on the parade route, and the fire burned so long, it burned the roof off the place. Uh, the, the church was about a block and a half long after they had added on to it after, through all the years with classrooms and the annex. And so they had the huge church building proper where the fire started and uh, went up through the um, steeple. And then they had the classroom building and they had another little building next to it. So it was ended up being a block and a half. And by this time it went on for hours. It was a cold, really cold day. And, uh, the parade brought, the parade had finished up, and so everybody from the parade was coming up to the fire because that was the next thing to watch for you know the holiday and um luckily for us, there were many ambulances there um uh, volunteer firefighters and ambulances were lined up just to watch the fire and um and I can remember the deputy saying to me, you know he said because I was a new battalion chief, he said that he said calling he said uh this is how you don't fight a fire." And I said, oh, I said, I'm getting it. And um, but for most of the fire, everybody had their SCBAs on, um, it, you know, and even though it went on for hours, the chief of the department came, the assistant chief of the department came and uh, it, it went on for quite some time. And um, they. Uh, the chief of the department started into it with the deputy chief they were going back and forth and um and it was getting a little contentious 
and like I said, this was several hours into the fire, and they were just trying to. Um, the chief of the department wanted them to start to break down the fire and send some companies back because there was a huge crowd of people watching, and uh, they were arguing over if the steeple fell, which way it would fall. Would it fall into the structure, or would it fall out into the street? Is that right? Yeah. And um, and so they called a break to all the activities, shut down all the lines just to see, and there was really nothing left of the entire church roof, all that heavy timber. I mean, it was just a skeleton of what it was. And then there were four spears on the tower that were there, and there was still smoke coming out of that and into the annex. And at that time, I was sent to impound the gear from the original firefighters that were um, uh, involved in the backdraft because they had all they were all at the hospital. Um, with various stages, one had a broken wrist, other had burns, and because they had burns, you know, obviously we have to check their gear out. If they had all their gear on, how the heck did they get burned? So um, I had to go around the entire block in order to get to the other side of the building where they had the gear, which was the furthest away from the, the steeple that you could get in the, the whole church proper. Somewhere in that time, I'm not sure because nothing was transmitted over the radio as to they were going to resume any kind of um, overhaul or any kind of entry. And I knew when I went that there was still conversations going on between the chief and the deputy in charge of the fire. And so um, within, I put the last pair of boots into the back of the truck that was around the corner. And as I put them in there, the whole street started shaking the whole i mean and you could just feel crumbling in the in the reverberations of that you know and uh the and then it was just complete silence and zero visibility yeah. and you couldn't see anything you really couldn't see anything and i and i um had no idea what was going on and there was nothing going on on the radio at all and um right after that occurred um there was like a half a mayday call. It seemed like it was a mayday, but it really was garbled. And it turns out that that was a firefighter that was upstairs in the um, annex to the church. When everything collapsed and the steeple came in, the heavy timbers came into the classrooms and there was a bunch of firefighters trapped in, in that area. And since he had never used a radio before, because we didn't have individual radios at that mm -hmm. time, um, he, no one could figure out what he was saying. And so myself and the arson investigator um, between us, because there were no chief officers left on scene intact because the deputy was smashed into the ground, um, unconscious, and Charlie was missing. Um, and apparently he had been ordered into the vestibule by the chief of the department to watch over a couple of firefighters with lines to put out hot spots. Yeah. None of that makes any sense to me because there, again, there was no directions given over the air uh, at the time that I went, which was less than probably 15 minutes. No one had their SCBAs on again, but some of them did have them put them back on when they went in to, um, and so it just became a real mess. Um, we knew we had two people missing um, that took a while because people were working with other companies that day because it was the day of the parade. And so everybody was budding for other buddy or people were on vacation because they enjoy the parade. And um, it accounting for them was um, tough, but it was easier through the processes that we learned through Bryceland Street, but still took a while. Um, when we figured out it was Rick Stefanikis and Charlie Brace. And, um, uh, they searched, we tried to figure out for a while, we could hear Rick's past device way down in the rubble at that time. They also called for, uh, uh, a newly, a newly started, uh, urban search and rescue team. They had got the equipment, hadn't got all the training. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? That's where they were just in that part of the time. And, uh, was hoping that Charlie maybe was in a void somewhere in the basement, but, um, that didn't turn out to be the case. So um, I was sent to go tell um, Charlie Brace's wife to make notification to her 
What was um, that like? Um, I, I, to think, I mean, I know that there are people designated to do that with, with the military. Um, I wouldn't wish that on anybody to make that notification. And I, and I say that because, you know, all of us know um, that if we were to see a chief's car pull up outside of our house and we had a family member in the fire service, what that means. And so when I pulled up outside of um, Jamie Brace's house, um, I knocked on the door and she opened the drapes and she saw me and she looked back and she saw my car. Now, Charlie only lived two streets down from me. I mean, we lived in the same neighborhood. And um, so um, she shut the drapes and she didn't open the door. Really? And, uh, you, yeah, were by, I, you were by yourself? My husband was in the car. Um, as he ended up at the fire also that day. Oh. Um, he was working. He was a captain on a, in a different station at that time. So um, he stayed in the car and I said, let me go do this. And um, so she didn't open the door. And so I stood there because I figured I was just thinking, what would I do if I were yeah. her? So I just stood there and I waited. Um, then she eventually did open the door um, and I went in. Um, and then I and then I uh, called my husband in. Um and because we hadn't recovered him yet, she asked me to take her to the scene. Can you do that? Well, what would you do? It, yeah, that's what I would do. I thought to myself, my husband's there. If this was my husband. That's what you're going to want to do. That's what I'm going to want to do. That's what she asked me to do. And that's what I did. Um, and she stayed until um, he he was recovered. Um, and then I took her to where her son was. He was in college. He, her youngest son was in college at the time in the city of Pittsburgh. And um, I took her to him. And, um, you know, and went through that whole process with her, with the National Fire Academy and the Fallen Firefighters. Yeah. And I thank God. Um, that I was her escort for that and that she met a lot of really great people there that really helped her through this. Um, but, and I thank God because I don't think that as a department, we helped her very much. Um, certainly, certainly the command staff could have done a much better job and should have taken notes from Charlie Dickinson um, because NIOSH was already in place, but they would not allow NIOSH to come in initially. Um, that pr was the problem was there were so many alarms that there were so many firefighters there and so many firefighters who, you know, still were dealing with Bryceland Street nine years later yeah. that, um, <laughs> that they deserved more than that too. And they deserved answers and they weren't getting them. And so it really just shook the department to its core. Um, it should have because it was not handled properly. But when the, in the city, they have a board of inquiry, their own board of inquiry, and they did their own investigation and analysis. And when the report came out and so many people were there and, and the report was not anything like what we had all experienced. Right. Um, there was a large outcry, and that's finally when NIOSH was brought in. But the church was already destroyed, so they went by the records and the uh, photographs and the arson investigation. And um, so it could have been handled much better, and it wasn't. Um, so I, on one hand, you see how things could have been handled extremely well. And on the flip side, how awful um, it is when you are not transparent um, because even if it's not your fault and it's not your fault, there was, there was things that could have been done so much better. Um, but accountability is key and, uh, and there was none. 
I feel your pain in your voice. To this day. Yeah, to this day. Um, and it is, uh, it is part of how I even got involved in teaching at the National Fire Academy, actually, because I used to teach a lot of incident safety officer, and I still teach it, and I teach it on request. And, and um, you know, um, but um, leadership, obviously, is extremely important to me. Um, accountability, um, never, uh, this career can humble you in a moment. Um, in so many ways, this being one of the most tragic ways, but I mean, in this world today of of um, people who believe that they are above reproach or people who head gets too big with leadership, this career can humble you in a moment. Um, and, um, and that is something never to lose sight of, no matter what position you're in, uh, truly. Yeah. Well, but, the the stories that you're telling, I appreciate you more than I can express for you. <clears throat> excuse me, sharing. But for some reason, it, it reminds me of how much trauma I've experienced. Not in a comparison way, but just in a, I've never really thought about it kind of way. And. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging me truly, um, to think that, you know, when we, when we talk about creating a, a work environment, you know, one of the things that I sh strive to do is, is to create a positive environment. Um, the, it it's it's not only the wrong action that can be detrimental it's inaction mm -hmm. um there's there's just so much and and you have to give people grace right because people learn um but not talking about it not not uh learning from it you know what what is the what is the the bigger tragedy uh n not learning the lesson uh, learning the lesson or or not learning the lesson uh making the mistake and not learning from it or you know what I'm trying to say I'm kind of stumbling through that um you know it, making mistakes is part of human nature but if you if you don't learn from it um and you have to like i said give people grace because those mistakes sometimes are going to happen at the most inopportune times um and people are people are people um nobody's perfect um i look back now and think about some of the things that I did as a an officer in my department, and I shudder. But I didn't know what what I know now. You know, unfortunately, I, I didn't I didn't have the opportunity to have made the mistake and learned the lesson and incorporate that into who I am. And and uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you because you 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 did that in spite of or under some really difficult circumstances, some of which had to do with you being a female, some of it having nothing to do with, you know, you being a female. Not, not everything that happened to you in your department was based upon your, your gender. Um, that's correct. But that's some of the hardest things too, because that's the problem. Many times, you don't know. So you don't want to live with that filter on all the time. Are they doing this because I'm a woman or the, because that's, that's not fair either. Yeah. So, but if you, but if 
you'd be a fool to think that some of the things aren't happening because you are, because you vote, you know, you've already lived that, but not everything, certainly. Um, but it makes it, it's a battle that you don't necessarily have to have that I have to have many times, but I have to try and analyze the situation in with that filter. Right. You know, and, and that's not always fair. And I wished that, I wouldn't have had to live my career like that because that's exhausting. <laughs> it, it, it feels exhausting. I don't I mean, Mike, tell me, tell the truth. Right. I mean, I'm sitting here saying we had it easy. I didn't have to do with line of duty death. Thank God. I told a lot of people that their family member had died. None of them were somebody I knew or were related to a firefighter. And that's why I can, I can, uh, a tiny bit of empathy, but I could never understand what it been like or what you did. But I also really appreciated Mike's question where you said, you know, did you take her there? Hell yeah, I took her there. Because that's what I would want if I asked for it. I want to be able to do it. And it's, it's almost, well, it's almost like you started this whole conversation. You listened mm -hmm. and, and you took care of the person of what they needed. And uh, yeah, it's, Absolutely blessed. I mean, I refer to my career as a blessed walk through hell because obviously I've had my own version of the shit I had to go through. Uh, but in the end, it was still a blessing to be able to serve and to, and to be able to have an opportunity to be a chief department and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure you did the same thing when we got down to South Carolina because that was a whole nother world to walk into. Outsider, female, not from this area. Yeah, yeah. Oh, imagine that because I was also an outside oh, yeah. chief. But I didn't go to another state. That's a different yeah. culture. <laughs> so yeah, so there's PTSD from that too. Uh, but no, it's it, the the line of duty deaths you were part of, or at least your department was part of. Um, I used to teach firefighters, and my first night was a when I was a fire instructor, an active fire instructor. The first night we always did safety, and they always thought it was going to be easy paperwork and an hour of safety. No, I preached safety for four hours. I, I beat it into their heads. And I said, you will respect Captain Brockstrom and Firefighter Shearer from Coleraine Township because they didn't walk around the house. And they should have learned that lesson from Pittsburgh for realizing that there's four stories here, not two. Uh, yep. And it's just the, the same lessons that say you have to respect their memories and learn what they have to say. But I couldn't imagine having to have had been through part. That was actually one of the things, you know, I want to be religious, but I prayed that I'd never had to be chief. I had to handle the LOD. Death while I was chief, I got lucky. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I do. I, I considered it um, an honor, obviously, to um, be a pallbearer for Patty and for Charlie. Um, but uh, I, I, I wished I would have never had to be any of that. To be honest. Can I ask you a question? I'm going to ask a question. You don't have to answer it. Uh, how supportive was your marriage, your husband, your spouse throughout this process? So it's interesting, you know, um, because my husband many times would wanted to beat the crap out of people. <laughs> Um, and, and rightfully so. I mean, you, you no could doubt. honestly, I mean, you, you could see how he would feel that way. And I, and, that, and that was always a, a battle, uh, not a battle between him and I, but many, many discussions on, you know, what his place should be with me being the all woman officer. Obviously, um, I couldn't have him fight my battles, even if that wasn't what's happening or yeah. people thought, you know, that was right. what it is. So, um, my husband was very secure in his manhood and his marriage. Um, so, you know, people always asked him that, how did he deal with a, a wife who had rank on him? And he said, let you don't kid yourself. Your wife has rank on you also. Yeah. So <laughs> I, know, I know who my boss is. <laughs> you know, exactly. You know what I mean? So, so that never faced him at all, but, um, but yeah, it was tough. It was tough many times. I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we can't go through 26 years of, of stuff. And I wished I didn't go through it either, but I still love the service. And so I think, you know, people say, oh, you know, you should write a book, this and that. And now, and now I really shouldn't because I, 
I am a firm believer in my glass is half full and I will learn from my mistakes, other people's mistakes. Um, or I don't have to relive that in order to, to move forward. Uh, because if I do that, you know, I tell people, I said, don't look back. You're not headed that way. You're headed forward. So yeah. I know those things. They never leave my mind. They're there, but I'm not going to live in that. You know, you don't grow from that. And, um, and that's, that's how you just keep pushing forward. Now, should and could we have had better psychological help in those days through PTSD for any number of things, Michael? Because I know you went through a lot of stuff in your mind you still wrestle with. We didn't have any of that um, kind of help or assistance or avenue at that time. And if we did, it certainly wasn't looked upon as something you sissy you're going to go see, you know. What's the matter with you? You know, suck it up, buttercup, move on. But, um, and that was that. Um, and certainly that wasn't helpful for us either. So, right. and, uh, but, you know, dealing with a lot of those things still. So, unfortunately or fortunately. But I get a lot of that out at the National Fire Academy when I teach. So, I think you get that feedback when you're the instructor. I, I do because see their eyes light up when they figure stuff out and they it's get exactly stuff right. back to you. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly right. And that never gets old for me at all. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. As long as I enjoy it and you can be passionate about it, then I'd like to do it. If I can't, then it's time for me to be done. You know? So talk to us about you're in Pittsburgh. You get promoted to deputy chief. You're thinking about chief of the department or no? No. I never thought about any, really. You know, I never thought uh, I'm, I'm going to be on a Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire. I'm, I'm going to immediately test off. I never thought any of that. I always just tried to be the best at what I was. Um, but when I did become deputy chief, um, and, I, and, and there was some wrestling, there was definitely, because there was so few, that there was a lot of um, uh, competition for the spots. How many and, deputy chiefs? At that time, there was um, five. Um, so, and, and they were still in the union. As hmm. of a couple of weeks ago, wow. they have just voted them out of the union. Um, but that's a whole other story. Yeah, it uh, is. Uh, uh, yeah, that will come next year. But they were all still in the union. So, um, so a whole lot of power play uh, and struggle with those positions and a lot of uh, bitterness. Um, that went along with that for people who believed that they should be in those positions. And I was now. So, um, I was finishing up the EFO program when I was a deputy chief and, um, I had gotten my master's degree and, you know, and chief Jones, who's still chief in the city. Now he had become the fire chief a few years prior. Um, and we had a pretty good relationship. So we would discuss a lot of things. And I started to, my youngest son was finishing up college and getting ready to start his first job in a career, which I thought it was going to be accounting. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> that didn't work out. But <laughs> um, So, yeah, so he had finished up college and he was into his first job when I started looking at positions. And, um, and I talked it over with my sons and my husband that I was going to start looking at some uh, places. Uh, Chief Jones, Daryl thought I should be looking at other metros. And I thought, I just spent 26 years in a metro. I'm done with metro. I'll look at other positions, but hopefully somewhere warm. Um, so, um, and there wasn't anywhere else for me to go in the city other than uh, uh, take an assistant chief's job, which was less pay. And yeah. that would have been, um, and, um, and obviously Daryl was chief. So, and I, I don't think that that probably would have been any kind of good move at that time. At that point, my older son was already on the job. I think that would have been odd for him. Um, so that wasn't anything that I was really looking to do. Uh, but I thought I could be a chief somewhere, and I um, I thought I had um, something to offer. So I just kind of put put my foot in the pond and, and said, let's see what happens. So how do you find St. John, St. John's? I, I'm not sure, sure I could find that on a map right now. Yeah, you could. It's right outside Charleston, uh, actually. Charleston. Yeah. Yeah, right outside Charleston. Um, <laughs> and at that time, there were already two women chiefs in that specific area. Um, so there was Charleston, North Charleston, and um, 
you remember the super super fire was in Charleston, right? Yes. Yes. Well, correct. some of some of the city of Charleston's area now is on John's Island, which is where my fire department was. It was called St. John's Fire District. It took um, it had uh, four barrier islands, Kiowa, which is where the PGA was held in 2013. Um, so I was still there when that was held, um, which is a very high end double gated community. Um, Been there. McMansion. Really nice. Yeah. Yes. Of Seabrook. course you have, Benson. Yeah, right. I stayed yeah. on Seabrook. Yeah. We went over and visited Kiowa shop. Yeah, so Seabrook <laughs> was the other. Um, 24, it's more, that's more of a 24-7 community. Um, little step down from Kiowa, beautiful though, but there's more 365 people than Kiowa. Kiowa has many vacation homes. And then Wamala, which was descendants of uh, the slaves. So they're... Um, uh, very interesting and also then very high end horse farms and then john's island proper which some of it is um some of it is annexed into the city and some of it is not so it was um a lot of territory a lot of islands that during hurricane season were cut off from other islands and so it was very um interesting uh part of uh, which I thought was going to be an easy job. Oh, you know, I come from a metro department. I'm going to seven stations, mm -hmm. 126 mm -hmm. personnel. How hard can it be? Well, <laughs> they had no HR. They had no, uh -huh. you, you were everything. You negotiated mm -hmm. their health care. You did all of that. All of that. All wow. of a sudden you were city manager um, and you had to answer to, to several different governments. And then Charleston County is the one who approved your budget. I was going to say the county did everything, right? Yeah, you just well, had your district, right? Well, no, but yeah. the county only approved the budget. You set up the yeah. budget. Your commissioners voted it's on like the budget, and then it went up to Charleston County. Yeah. So you not only had to deal with those governments, your your district government, because the town of Kiowa has a government. The town of Seabrook has a government. Um, Wamala, there's another little area down on Wamala that has its own government. And then... We had, I had nine fire commissioners that represented all those districts, and then I had to go to Charleston County to get the budget approved, one in front of all the Charleston County Council people. So it was a huge learning experience. I learned a ton, which oh, yeah. is helpful to me when I'm working with all the diverse departments that come to the National Fire Academy. Was I never would have understood any of that from a metro you don't see any of this. You don't see any of the small departments, the districts, the small municipalities, the volunteer groups. You can't, I don't want to say you can't appreciate, but if you don't know it, you've never seen it, you haven't lived it, you have no idea. It's a whole different world, um, which I learned a ton. So I have no regrets. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. Um, eight and a half years of a lot of work, but I'm really glad that, uh, for the experience for sure. And a lot there's of great a, people too. There's not a hurricane. It's really nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> they keep coming. I know. Well, although they haven't had a really big one in a long time, but hey, they've had many, yeah, many close calls. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Why? Why are you living there in a hurricane area now? Oh, no. I, but if a uh, former girlfriend lives down there, their friend's down there. Uh, and of course, yeah. we like to vacation down there, so we don't want to mess it up. On Seabrook, you know where I like to go now. My sons like to go, which is where we go, Edisto, because they you yeah, still allow right shark fishing. Waist. Yeah, we were thinking yeah. about going down there. Yeah. Oh, it's a crazy kind of island. It's kind of eclectic. Um, crazy kind of island. Very nice. My sons love it because they're outdoors guys, and they love it. So, um, so we'll be going together no, again. How much June? accounting outdoors? How they end up being firefighters? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I give him credit. My son, um, he played college football, and he, he was a really number-smart kid. Um, so he got out of college, and he started to do the legwork now to become a CPA. So he was doing, you know, uh, entry-level auditing, that's this, good, that, and That's everything. a good side job, yeah. It was. And so about a year into it, he's like, Mom, um, and the firefighter test was coming up in Pittsburgh. He's like, um, I think this job is going to kill me. <laughs> he was, he was bored to death. He hated it. Um, so he said, I'm going to take the firefighter test. And I said, well, you know, he did everything I asked him to do, you know, finish college, started into his career. And so, you know, I was, you know, how do you tell your sons, your children not to do something that you really love to do your whole life? Yep. And, that's really hard to say. So I really loved what I did. I went through a lot of crap, different job for me than it was for them, will be for them. 
but I still love what I did. So. So it sounds like this experience is another example of strength from diversity because now you can relate so much better to your students who come to the National Fire Academy. And are you mentoring folks that you have met through the NFA, uh, folks that kept up with you? Because that's one of the reasons that Michael and, and Rob and I are, are good buddies. We all, we all do DFO together. But having that connection to folks, and there's still some people that I talk to, to you know, just check in on them and make sure they're doing well and, and uh, helping them out. So are you getting that kind of uh, – mentorship availability through being their instructor than turning into a mentor absolutely absolutely um and in fact yeah i was actually when i went down to st john's um two gentlemen um i encouraged through the efo program they are both now chief officers one is chief of st john's and another one went to uh idaho he's a fire Mm -hmm. chief there um the same is uh, and so like you I'm in touch with, there was a core group of guys that we did almost the four, four years. And I am in touch with them multiple times a week by text because they drive me nuts on the text stream. But, <laughs> but, but, um, I mean, it, I mean, just a, just a really, and, and some of them are still chief officers. The one thing that I really like about some changes they're making to the EFO program is bringing people in younger um, so that they can get the full use and experience of what they learn there right, um, right. and can really put it to work. So, um, and hopefully that's, that's what they're looking for in this new round of applications that are, that are coming in um, as we speak. Um, and so that's what I hope for. Um, but yeah, I, um, I particularly, you know, um, answer any questions. I always give people my phone number and um, there are people that I follow when I track and I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful about um, the changes that have been made. It, it's definitely a rough patch that I think that um, anything with change brings. And this was particularly rough when you added all the ingredients and COVID. So, but I think that, you know, they're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And at least that's, you know, that's my hopes because um, you want to see a stronger fire service and not, and um, in this program, you want to. This is a good program. I mean, you all, if you've been through it and you know it, um, what there are things that you um, will never forget, and or relationships you've made that still help you along the way. I can attest to that. So, um, I would hate to see it uh, stumble and and not get back up. Yeah, the two best things I got out of EFO, other than Michael, Michael uh, is is the. <laughs> the the networking of folks, uh, that that's huge. And then knowing how to do research, because I did bad research. I knew how to, I learned how to not do a research paper because uh, we were still doing four back then. Yeah. And uh, so I learned how to do bad research papers so I could then become good at it. So then when I did my master's and help other people and uh, be able to do research and actually figure stuff out, now. it helps with our uh, our business. So it's not well in the retirement. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I am. Um... Um, I never considered myself to be that red circle, red circle, red pen kind of person, but now my eyes automatically, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and so good or bad, you know, but I hope it helps. That's awesome. <laughs> Colleen, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. First, first thing that comes to your mind, favorite thing about being a fire chief? Uh, helping people. Least favorite thing about being a fire chief? Uh, HR problems. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you're pregnant? I just promoted you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of what are you most proud in your career? Woof. Wow. Mm. Um. Take your time. So, you know, there was an Irish prayer that uh, I was telling you about Patty Conroy. You know, she was extremely religious Catholic, but there was an Irish prayer. And basically the essence of it is leave it better than you found it. And I hope that um, I have left the service, whatever footprint is, I I left it better than I found it. And I think... um, in my mind, there's many instances uh, that I did. Others probably I could have 
um, done better, but I did the best I could w with what I had. Anything jump out at you in particular? Something that that you're involved with? Something that you? Anything at all that stands out to you? Um, you know, one of the things that you know early on in my career, what I found interesting, obviously, I never saw women on any kind of fire engine or truck growing up, I didn't know that that wasn't something you could even be in the city until 1976. Um, it was actually illegal um, up until 1973. Um, but um, watching a little girl's face, when I went into school one time and I was in my bunker pants and everything else and I got in, I guess they didn't realize we were going in for an alarm activation and I took off my helmet or whatever and a little girl realized that I wasn't a man. <laughs> and she, her face just lit up like, I didn't even know this was possible. Like you're, you're doing this, you're in, and yeah. And I never forget her face. And I, I remember the grade school um, that I was in, but I'll never forget her face. And I, I, I often wondered um, what she ended up doing, you know, with, with her life or her career. I never went back to find out, but it just didn't dawn on me. Um, obviously, until later, I never experienced it as a kid. And this was her first experience seeing a woman on a fire truck or um, in gear, um, but her face. And, you know, I won't, I won't be upset if we come reach a time where that never happens again, it's just second nature. Like, you know, that all kinds of people belong on fire apparatus, you know, but it just struck me as, you know, like a childlike uh, response, you know, and a surprise shock and awe, you know, not expecting that you were going to see a woman take her helmet off. And there I was in their school, you know, but isn't it funny in a, in a 35 plus year career that that that's that's what you remember mm -hmm. that's that's what's meaningful and it's yeah. those it's those type of things it's a response like that which is why i do this because you regardless of what that little girl turned out to be or to do you made a difference that day just by being you and and that message that that's that's not leadership that's mentorship as far as i'm concerned it's show is showing what can be for somebody else uh it it's it fascinates me <laughs> um what would you change if you could oh geez um Only I would, one. <laughs> well um I wished I could have uh paved an easier road for women uh coming behind me in the city. What I do you wish... think you could have done? Is there uh, is there a regret that you didn't do or do you just wish that there was more that you could have done? I wish that was more that I could have done. Um, I, I wish that was more that I could have done. I wish I could have been working with the city of Pittsburgh when more women were coming in the pipeline to become officers uh, or even coming on the job. Because um, for 17 years, they didn't hire women at all um, after we were on. So um, I wished I wished I could have. I wish I could have helped pave an easier road. I hope the road is easier. Um, to me, it has to be easier than it was. But I wish that I could have done more to make that easier. Um, you would think I it's easier. I would have, yeah. 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 And I, I, would say I, it, I, would I would say it is. I think you made it easier. Just by, Like Mike said, you being there, you've done it. And I totally oh. broke through the ice and, and you opened it up a little bit wider. I hope, Mom. 
I hope it's always concerned. You know, one of the things um when when both of the young ladies got promoted to lieutenant, you know, I I wrote them both a card and I sent it to their house and um you know, just to congratulate them but and about a huge step in their career and personal growth and you know that I was here if I was here if they needed me and my phone number or whatever and um you know so I still get to meet up with them we do a um Lisa Epps who is the fire marshal with the city she's been around for quite some time um she's been through some stuff herself but uh she started a girls camp um with exposing young ladies finally got it approved by the city to even allow it and you know and it has the um high five of the union which is tremendous um but uh um, awesome. and I, which i've participated in the last two years and i'm grateful for that because i enjoy seeing the young ladies come in and just see what it's about emergency services in general even if that's not the road they choose they at least get to see a little bit about the career the expectations um and what is possible you know so that's important to me also and she does a great job yeah, so fantastic Last, yeah. last question I have for you, and then Michael, if you have anything else, and then I I gotta thank our sponsor, which I I realized <laughs> I, I forgot to do. Question for you. Last question I have is, in a message to your young to your younger self, what would you say? Oh, um, message to my younger self. Um. Hang in there. It gets better. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? You know? Does it? Yeah, I think. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, I, you know, when the when the good outweighs the bad, yeah, it's better. When you enjoy going to work every day, when you enjoy what you do, that's important. So um, even in the bad times, not losing sight of what you enjoy. So it gets better. Fantastic. You give me strength. Uh, truly. Uh, the perseverance, uh, resilience, whatever the right word is, I don't want to put the wrong word on it. Just those words come to mind. Uh, you could very easily have said, I'm out. Deuces. Um, and and uh, you didn't. Um uh, and for that, I draw strength from you. Um, oh, thank you. Michael, anything for uh, for Colleen? No, the, uh, the only comment I'll make is I'm always impressed by anybody who can go into a place where you are not, there's nobody else there, you're by yourself. Yes. Uh, whether you're a person of color or you're the only female or whatever it is, and if you're in a room and nobody looks like you. And to <laughs> not only persevere but to be successful and to thrive and then pass that move that forward makes you an exceptional person so it's really really good to have you on this uh, podcast with us i really appreciate you meeting with you and we need to keep talking i guess some other stuff i want to talk to you about not really <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you thank you for the kind words like i said but you know one day at a time that's how you get to the next one day at a time so small bites well, what made this conversation possible was the sponsorship of Command Consulting LLC, Solutions That Work. I forgot to do the commercial in the beginning of the podcast. Yeah. So that's our sponsor. in there somewhere. We're fine. That's all right. Command Consulting LLC, Solutions That Work. What we do, what do we do, Michael Benton? What do they do? Uh, emergency service consulting, shared services consulting, but mostly electrification. And if and, you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to talk to me. <laughs> That's right. So we uh, hopefully will have articles some, out there. There's articles out there. One that was posted today. Uh, there, yeah, microgrid oh, knowledge interviewed me. Uh, we've got uh, articles from Firehouse Magazine. We've done the fire station expo or symposiums and that kind of thing, trying to explain to people that you need to actually build and design a completely different fire station. Colin, what are your thoughts energy on wise? Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on electric vehicles? Electrification. Oh, um, it is it is obviously a wave of the future, but it's going to have some hiccups along the way mm -hmm. exactly. uh, on many fronts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, you need people like Michael Benson and and uh, 
Command Consulting LLC to help you answer those those questions. So, Colleen, thank you so much for making time. It was a pleasure to have you on. Um, we're going to wrap up for the night, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Oh, thank you, Michael. Michael, and thank you for the invitation. I I really enjoyed it, and I'm glad we finally got this done. Agreed. <laughs> have a good night. Thank you.